All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I got to say, as a professor, this whole virtual summit arena is so new to me, and it's it's a little strange to not be able to see all your beautiful faces, but uh, definitely interact with me on the Slack channel so we can get these conversations going. So I'm going to be talking about the real CSI, my journey to becoming a forensic scientist, a professor, and also a STEM program director. So the flow of my presentation goes a little something like this. So I'm gonna start by introducing myself and talk about some goals for this presentation. I'm going to take you way back when to the 80s where it all began. And then I'm gonna go through these three different aspects of my life, the forensic science realm, the academia realm and the outreach realm. And then talk to you all about how you can get involved in some of these things as well. Along the way, I'm going to drop a couple of uh, STEM success tips, and then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. So just a few notes. Um, as you think of questions, definitely drop them in the Slack channel. Uh, I have the address there in the speaker chat, so I can make sure that we address those at the end. And just a reminder that anything I talk about in this presentation is, of course, a reflection of my own experience and my own perspective. And I love diversity of thought, diversity of opinion. So if your experience is different, I would love to hear from you all. So all about me. So I'm Kelly Knight. I am a proud wife and mom of two boys. You all pray for me with these two boys. I'm currently a professor at George Mason University teaching in the forensic science program. And I'm also a part of a unique program there at George Mason called the STEM Accelerator Program. So as a STEM Accelerator, um, my primary role is K through 12 STEM outreach. And kind of my hallmark program is the females of color and those underrepresented in STEM, which is a STEM program that targets middle and high school girls of color. So the goals of this presentation is to first give all of you an insight as to what STEM success has looked like for me. Keep in mind that STEM success or success in general looks different for everybody. Um, and I think there's value in hearing different people's stories um, because some you may resonate with. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it looks like for me. Um, also giving you all some alternative career information. So you know what it looks like to be a forensic scientist, what it looks like to be a professor. And then again, talking about the outreach realm. So what does outreach look like? What is outreach? How can you get involved in outreach? All right, so first things first, be honest, go on the Slack channel and tell me how many of you came to this presentation because you thought this was about to be just like CSI. Um, you were expecting a CSI episode, Blood and Guts, wanted to hear all of the nitty gritty about that. Go ahead and tell me if that's why you're here. Um, spoiler alert, it's not just like CSI. Um, so let me know if that's what brought you here, that's cool, but we're gonna talk a little bit about forensics in more detail and kind of dispel some of those myths. So here's where it all began for me. Um, I am a product of an educator and someone who was involved in aviation. My dad was an air traffic controller. And so education and STEM were always a big part of my life beginning in childhood. Um, my dad and my mom thankfully never pushed typical girl stereotypes on me. Um, I loved Barbies, but they didn't force me to play with Barbies. Um, they made it okay for me to play with planes and to build rockets and all of those things. And so they, they made me feel normal in the fact that I love STEM. And they really fostered that love for STEM in me by providing activities for me, taking me to different STEM activities um, to participate in, such as space camp. So I know y'all are probably laughing at me and my drop socks at my first space camp. <laughs> um, but I got to tell you, that experience really changed my life. So not only did it kind of solidify for me how much I really loved just STEM areas in general, but 
it was really the first place that I experienced imposter syndrome. And I've listened to several of the talks over the last two days and they've all been so amazing. And I know that is definitely a buzzword. We've heard a lot, this imposter syndrome. And, you know, it feels good to be a part of a, com a community where you don't feel isolated that this isn't some oh. imaginary syndrome that people have made up that this is a real thing that people deal with and there's you know there there are ways to try to overcome it so at the time when i was a young girl in space camp i don't think i realized what i was experiencing was imposter syndrome but looking back on that i know that that feeling of isolation that feeling of i didn't belong i'm not supposed to be here nobody else looks like me um, definitely started at that early age nevertheless i persisted. I stayed in STEM, um, much thanks to my parents who, regardless of how I was feeling, they really continued to encourage me and keep me involved in STEM. And so in high school, there was anatomy and physiology laboratory on blood typing. And my teacher made it uh, kind of like a crime scene investigation simulation. So I think I'm kind of dating myself talking about blood typing in terms of forensic science. But, um, you know, this is what really started to spark my interest in forensics. I like to mention that this was pre-CSI, even though I have that CSI picture there. But um, that kind of changed my perspective. It gave me a different view of science. Um, up until that point, we had spent a lot of time learning, you know, very hard facts about science and you know all of these different biological processes and these kind of things and i don't think i experienced a teacher that really took the time to apply that science and when we did this crime scene laboratory that was really the first time that i saw how science and tech and you know all of these things actually affect us in a real world situation so i was very drawn to that and so i always kind of kept that in the back of my head so i resonated a lot with dr reed's presentation this morning when he spoke on how you know through high school he was an excellent student he got good grades and he kind of made that correlation between being smart and getting good grades. And I, I totally felt that I commented in the Slack channel that I, I felt seen because that's, that's how I felt. I did really well in high school. I was even valedictorian and I thought, you know, I've got it all together. I thought I was the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and then that all changed really quickly. I went to George Washington University and I decided at first that I was going to be pre-med. Um, I'm not quite sure why I was so fascinated with being a doctor. I think it was more so a salary thing than anything else. Um, but after I took my first biology class in undergrad, that changed. So I got a C in my first biology class and all of a sudden the imposter syndrome hit me again. I hadn't really experienced it since space camp. Uh, really, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I realized after Dr. Reed's talk that it was that fixed mindset that was kicking in. I was correlating the fact that I was getting a bad grade with the fact that I was no longer smart, that I didn't belong, that I couldn't be successful. Um, and that really weighed on me. And it was very, very discouraging. So I switched out of pre-med. I ended up getting really good grades in chemistries at the time. So I switched to chemistry as a major and did well at first. And then all of a sudden, you all know the course, I hit orgo and it all went downhill. <laughs> so I hit orgo and I had to retake orgo two twice. Um, and for me, that was a killer. It, it went back to, back to that fixed mindset. Why can't I do this? Why am I not getting good grades? I'm not smart. I don't belong here. Um, and so the next couple of years for me were really a struggle. Um, unfortunately, my, my story didn't end as well as, his, uh, as Dr. Reed's did in undergrad. Um, I continued to struggle throughout undergrad. I struggled silently. There were several reasons why I struggled other than you know having that imposter syndrome. I had a couple of bad experiences 
with faculty during office hours to the point where I just felt like, you know, this is no point. I'm not going to go to my teachers for help. So, you know, I, I got through undergrad, graduated barely by the skin of my teeth, um, but I did experience an internship, which was very much life-changing for me. And so for those of you who are students out there, um, this is when I really recommend that you do internships as soon as possible um, when you begin your, your academic career, because this can really shed light on your, your future academic path. So I got an internship with a DNA laboratory in Virginia called the Bodie Laboratory. They're the uh, largest private DNA laboratory in the world. And like I said, up until that point, you know, I was a chemistry major and my only experience with biology was <laughs> that C in intro biology. Um, but I was still very drawn to the work I was doing in the DNA laboratory internship. And so I ended up deciding that you know, I wanted to switch to this area of interest. I wanted to get into forensic DNA. Um, my GPA was barely a 3.0. And so, you know, now the question was, well, what do I do with this? Um, can I go to graduate school? Will I get in graduate school? I don't have the, you know, the academic background to really pursue this. So um, I ended up applying to uh, just one graduate school. But before I get into that, I just want to talk about one of my first STEM success tips, which is a reminder that, and Dr. Reed talked about this as well, your grades do not define your intelligence or your potential for success. Um, now, I know there's probably a lot of parents who are cringing at that thought and saying, please don't tell that to my child, uh, because I know everyone's dream and goal is to get straight A's and to be a 4.0 student. Um, however, this is the fact of the matter. <laughs> you, uh, grades are important, absolutely, and they will get you uh, where you need to go in certain situations. But to keep that mindset that if I fail, I will not succeed is a very toxic mindset to have and something that we need to kind of recorrect um, or correct. Um, it also can be a, a kind of a toxic mindset, even from the perspective of faculty. I've seen it in my own work where I hear um, faculty members saying, you know, correlating that one student can't necessarily you know, do X, Y, or Z because their GPA is a 2.5 or whatever. That is a very faulty mindset to have um, when you start to correlate those, those grades with, uh, with an individual's potential to succeed. So I just um, encourage you all to kind of open your mind when it comes to that. <clears throat> right before I did this talk, my husband actually sent me this quote, which I thought was great. And I wish I had this when I was an undergrad. Uh, something to remember, the road to success and the road to failure are almost exactly the same. So in other words, the road to success is going to be paved with failures. So again, don't keep this faulty mindset that if you fail, you will not succeed. You have to keep in mind that failure is a part of success and it's okay. You have those failures and you learn from them and you move on and you become a better person. So like I mentioned, I ended up applying to one graduate school, Virginia Commonwealth University. At first I was waitlisted and I'm sure that was because of my less than stellar GPA, but I had um, the blessed opportunity of eventually getting in. The director of the program called me outright and said, what happened? What's going on? And I think through our phone call, I, I could prove to her that exactly what I said in terms of your grades not defining your intelligence. Yes, I did not graduate with the GPA that I wanted, but my work ethic was high, my ambition was high, my passion was high, and I was willing to do whatever it took to kind of turn that around. So <clears throat> she ended up hiring me actually to work in her DNA research lab, and that's really when things started to go up for me. I was at VCU, ended up becoming the laboratory manager of that research lab. Um, 
And this was the phase where I met my first mentor. So that director that admitted me to that program ended up becoming my mentor and it was a game changer. So having a mentor is something that I have heard several people speak on during the summit. And I will be yet another person to emphasize how important it is to have a mentor. So another STEM success tip, you must, absolutely must have mentors and or sponsors at every stage of your career, not just at the student phase, not just at the early professional phase, not even at the mid career or late career, you should always have a mentor and or sponsor who is helping you through the process. So a mentor is someone who's going to give you advice, they're going to be there to help guide you. A sponsor is someone who can take you to the next level. A sponsor is someone who can make those connections for you. A sponsor is someone who can put you in front of people and, and vouch for you and you know help you to get those positions that you may not have gotten otherwise if you didn't have those connections. So please make sure that you are putting in the work to seek out these mentors and sponsors because they will be a game changer for you. So it literally took just that one person to completely change my life. She, she spoke life into me, literally. Um, she believed in me and having that support was just an amazing asset as I went through my graduate career. So because of that experience in graduate school, I was lucky enough to be offered several different positions uh, working in crime labs. And I ended up taking a position with the Maryland State Police Forensic Sciences Division. So I was hired to work in their technical unit. And as a part of their technical unit, I did a couple of different things. One was I worked casework. So as a part of casework, that means I was processing rape cases, homicide cases, sexual assaults, um, any type of uh, crime that you could think of that would involve any type of biological evidence. I process those types of cases. Um, I was also involved in validation of new instruments and technology, which was a lot of fun. I trained other scientists in the laboratory did research and um, court testimony. So one big part of being a forensic scientist is you have to testify in court because you are processing things that are involved in the criminal justice process. So that is one thing that I was involved in at the Maryland State Police. Another big important part of my job there was being the lab tour coordinator. So as a forensic science lab, we got lots and lots of requests to come tour the lab from all different types of people, you know, student groups, um, state representatives, you name it, we got lots of requests. So our director sent out, our lab director sent out a request to the entire lab and said, hey, you know, we need somebody who can come and be our lab tour coordinator. And I'm pretty sure most of my coworkers were like, yeah, right, I have too much going on. Um, and initially I thought the same thing too, but then I thought a little bit further. I said, you know, being the lab tour coordinator is going to put me, in touch with a lot of different people. Um, and I love talking about my science. I love meeting new people. So I accepted that position. And what I realized was it was an amazing networking opportunity. And this is something else I've heard other speakers in the summit talk about, but that how important that networking piece is. Um, so that was an amazing opportunity. It open doors for me that I would have never even thought were possible. Um, I ended up being nominated to be the biology section chair of a regional organization because of it. Um, so, you know, for me, especially as a woman of color in STEM, when it's so easy to count us out just based on that basic stereotype. It has been really important for me throughout my career to make sure that I'm more than just a woman of color in STEM to people. I really wanted to make sure that people had the opportunity to meet me face to face, to talk to me, uh, for me to have an opportunity to share my knowledge with them. And I think that really changed the game for me in terms of networking was, you know, it, it allowed me to be more than just a name on a sheet of paper 
to people. And because of that, like I said, I had a lot of opportunities open to me that I'm pretty sure would not have been open to me had I just been comfortable sitting in my cubicle my entire career. Um, being the lab tour coordinator also kind of opened me up to teaching. So this was the first time I really had the opportunity to kind of get started with outreach um, on a professional level. And I learned the more I did outreach, how much I loved teaching people about forensic science. Um, so another STEM success tip here, never underestimate the power of a strong network. Uh, strong networks would take you places that grades and all of those things, you know, would possibly never take you. So I highly encourage you to work on your networking skills. This is a great networking opportunity, the STEM Success Summit. Take advantage of this, fill out that sheet that's in the Slack channel and get to know some of these STEM professionals that are near you, that are not close to you, uh, because having that community is going to be so important in your career. So going a little bit more into what it was like to be a forensic scientist for a career. So I've gone this far without really explaining to you what forensic science is. So forensic science is really any STEM discipline that's used for the purposes of the law. So for example, I had a biology background. So using my biology knowledge in order to solve crimes is what makes me a forensic scientist. So what they do is they analyze and examine evidence related to crimes and offenses. Um, there is a difference in, as in terms of where that's actually done, depending on the type of forensic scientist you are. So some forensic scientists work in the field, such as crime scene investigators, forensic anthropologists. They are ones who are actually out in the field versus your laboratory scientists like me, who worked in a laboratory on a day-to-day -day basis. But one thing we do all share in common is that 99% of us testify in court as well. Um, there are some forensic scientists that don't have to, but most of us testifying in court, like I mentioned before, is a huge part of our job. So here's a part you all want to know. Could you make all of your CSI dreams come true? And I have good news for you. So I know you've seen 12.5 million episodes of CSI or NCIS. Um, and you thought, oh, that looks like so much fun, right? <laughs> so the cool thing is, if you have a STEM degree or are studying STEM, you can become a forensic scientist. Because like I said, forensic science is an application of science to the law. So what's most important is that you have a foundation in STEM. As long as you have that foundation, you can apply it to be used as a forensic science. Other question is, are you a good speaker? So like I mentioned on a couple of slides, you have to testify in court. So being a good speaker is definitely something that you have to check off the list. Um, and not just being a good speaker, but um, not being a super nervous, anxious speaker. Because remember, as a forensic scientist, you're gonna be on the stand, you're gonna be answering rapid fire questions. And so being a good speaker in front of an audience versus being a good speaker on the stand and being able to explain your science to people who may not even have a high school degree and to be able to answer questions, some of which the entire purpose is to um, basically discredit you. Um, that's a totally different level. So have to have that checked off. Um, also, are you a good note taker and writer? So in forensic science, we are all very type A people. You have to take very meticulous notes. Someone needs to be able to come back behind you and know exactly what you did. Um, intellectual curiosity. So this point always makes me laugh because I like to correlate this to what my mama would have said was, I was just nosy as a child. 
Um, and I think that this was one way of me turning a neck something that was considered probably a negative into a positive. Um, yes, I was nosy, but when it came to forensic science, it meant that I wanted to know the answer to the puzzle. Um, it, it made me very curious. I wanted to know why things happened, uh, what was happening, how they were happening. So I think that aspect made me a very good forensic scientist. And this is a real question. So in something that you really have to think about if you're gonna be a forensic scientist, do you have a strong stomach? Um, and you really need to know the answer to that before you go into forensic science, because obviously some of the stuff that we deal with um, can be pretty gruesome and difficult to, to encounter. So you want to make sure you're not, you know, kind of losing it over top of your evidence or at the scene of a crime. And lastly, are you a person with a high, with high moral and ethical standards? So like I tell all of my students, being a forensic scientist means you're choosing a lifestyle. So that means you can't go work in the lab from nine to five and then go smoke weed with your friends at seven o'clock. Um, that doesn't work in forensic science. If you're a forensic scientist, you are on as a forensic scientist 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and any type of moral and ethical violation could absolutely put your job in jeopardy. Uh, so here I'd like to bring up another STEM success tip, which is it's okay to change your mind about your career, your academic path, whatever. Don't think it's too late. So for me, I wish in undergrad, instead of suffering through my four years of chemistry, I wish instead of being so focused on graduating in four years and not falling behind, I wish I had changed my mind and chosen a different academic path that would have made me happier. In terms of careers, some of you already have very well established careers, but you can always change. If that career stops making you happy, you can always look at doing something else. So as an example, I have had many students in my graduate class, especially that are in their 50s, in their 60s, have been doing jobs for decades and now want to do something that they really feel like they would enjoy. And they've come to our program, graduated, and had very successful careers in forensic science. So don't ever think you're so invested in something that you can't actually change. That's okay. So I just wanted to show for you all some of the different disciplines that fall under forensic science. There's so many, um, again, because this is an applied science. So there's so many different disciplines that kind of fall under forensics. And I just wanted to highlight a couple for you all in terms of what types of careers you could do with your different degrees. So like I said, some of you are actually studying STEM right now. Some of you are already STEM professionals. I'm sure we have plenty of scientists in um, on the chat. We have I know lots of engineers, we have some people who are doing math degrees, people who have IT backgrounds or computer science backgrounds. All of those things can be applied to forensics. So for example, if you have a science background, if your degree is in biology or chemistry or whatever, you can become a DNA analyst, you could work in a chemistry lab or a toxicology lab. If your um, background's in technology, Cybersecurity and digital forensics are huge right now. There is an incredible need for people to fill those positions, as well as biometrics, which basically merges technology with the science of identifying people. So the DNA, the facial recognition, the fingerprints. Engineers, um, you need to have that very specific background in order to be involved with things like accident investigations, bridge collapses, things of that nature. And then for math, there are people that are needed in order to do forensic accounting. Um, in DNA, a huge part of our job is calculating statistics. And most DNA analysts are not expert mathematicians. So we need statisticians who are able to calculate or help provide us with the proper equations in order to do our statistics. And pretty much any background, you could do any STEM background, you could do crime scene investigation, you could do 
Um, some of our impression sciences like firearms and tool marks or latent prints. Those are fields where you, you could definitely use some additional training, um, such as maybe, you know, starting out with, um, as an officer or something like that. Um, that's going to give you or an internship that's going to give you that additional training to work in those impression fields um, and consulting. So I wanted to bring up that as a STEM expert, you have knowledge that is needed by many, many people. And you can leverage that knowledge in order to be a consultant. So maybe you don't want to do these careers as a forensic scientist full time, but maybe you are an engineer and you have, you know, specialized knowledge in accident investigation. Maybe that's something you could do on the side as a forensic consulting position. So keep that in mind that this is not something that you have to do full time. You could certainly use your STEM background in order to become a consultant in the field of forensic science. So forensic scientists work at all different types of places, um, federal government and military agencies. You could work law enforcement. So for example, I work for the Maryland State Police, medical examiner's office. Uh, you could work in private industry. So Bodhi, the lab I had mentioned in the beginning that I did my internship at was a private DNA laboratory. You could do research or teach forensic science at a college or a university. And there are even museums that are hiring forensic scientists as well. So let's talk about the specialized training. So say you wanna live your, your greatest CSI dreams now. So do you need any type of specialized training? Well, that really depends on which discipline you go into. So for many of the disciplines that fall under that umbrella of forensic science, a degree in a STEM field is sufficient. So for example, if you have a biology degree or a chemistry degree, there is a great chance that you can be hired straight into a forensic biology or a forensic chemistry lab. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna give you the on the job training for the application. The hard part is learning the scientific knowledge that is behind all of that. Um, for, for some disciplines, there is some additional training that is required. So make sure you do your research on which field you're interested in. So for example, if you wanna be a medical examiner, these are the individuals who are involved in autopsies and determining, determining cause and manner of death. Um, you have to be an actual doctor in order to do that. So you would go on to medical school and then you would have to do your residency in forensic pathology and that would be your specialty basically. Um, and then also there are some fields within forensic science that do require a PhD. Again, it doesn't have to necessarily be um, a forensic science PhD, but for example, if you want to be an anthropologist or toxicologist, there are some laboratories that do require you to have a PhD um, at that level. So let's say you go straight from a STEM degree and you're ready to apply to forensic science positions. And the question is, you know, we just went over the specialized training. Is it required? No, but is it preferred? Of course. So your options in terms of specialized training do not necessarily have to be a whole entire degree. So yes, there are master's programs in forensic science, there are bachelor's programs in forensic science, but there are also, as an example, certificate programs in forensic science. So at George Mason, we offer a graduate certificate in forensic science, which I hate to say it like this, but it's kind of like half a master's. So if a master's is 36 credits, um, a graduate certificate is about 18 credits. So you're not going the full distance of a master's, but that's going to give you that specialized forensic training. Uh, there's also the opportunity to attend forensic science specific workshops and meetings, such as um, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meeting. The next one for that is going to be held in February in Anaheim, California. 
there's the International Association of Identification, and then there's also regional forensic organizations. So if you're interested in getting involved in forensic science, I recommend reaching out to these organizations, these professional organizations, and seeing what type of workshops they're offering and when their meetings are, because that's a great way to get this additional training in forensics to put on your resume. So some of the pros and cons of forensic science. One of the huge pros for me is it wasn't monotonous. So I love that on a day-to-day -day basis, I was working different cases. It was always kind of like a new puzzle to solve. Very stimulating in terms of um, being intellectually stimulating and challenging um, because you were always trying to figure something out. So I love that. Also, that feeling of contributing to something bigger than yourself, contributing to the justice system is a really rewarding feeling as well. The cons, limited flexibility, and I say that kind of loosely. I mean, it really depends on what discipline you're in, where you're working, but your hours and you know the days and times you have to come in are gonna be pretty rigid. Uh, a lot of times you have to coordinate your schedule around court appearances, and if you work in the field, your schedule may be very irregular. So if you go into crime scene, there's a chance that you get called to a crime in the middle of opening Christmas gifts with your children, which can be a con for some people for obvious reasons. Also that potential vicarious trauma. So I just learned this term at a workshop I went to a couple of weeks ago, this term of vicarious trauma. And essentially what it means is you yourself are not going through these specific crimes. You are not the one that was raped or anything like that, but because you are constantly exposed to these things, you as a scientist experience vicarious trauma. And I think most forensic scientists ways of dealing with that is to just kind of suppress it and move it on and just kind of think about this is my job. But it is something to consider if you are very sensitive emotionally, um, if you have certain triggers, it may not be the best field for you to go into just because your day to day job is to literally be confronted with the evidence of the trauma of other individuals. And then also the justice system can be incredibly frustrating at times. So um, as great as it is and as rewarding as it is to work in the justice system, there are certain things about it that can be frustrating as a scientist. Um, sometimes when you process cases, if you are exposed to the outcome and maybe it's not what you thought it was gonna be, that could be discouraging. Um, so just keep those things in mind. And then another thing, I don't know, uh, I think I'll, there's a lot of reasons why people I think would consider this a pro, but fun fact, about 80% of forensic scientists are women. So if you go to any forensic science meeting, lab, you're going to see mostly women. And there are some theories as to why that is, and I'd love to go over them with you all in the Slack channel, but, um, for me, I really enjoyed that because as a woman in STEM, it was a very welcoming environment to be in a laboratory setting where there were lots of people who looked like me in terms of being a woman. So uh, for me, that was certainly a pro. So um, transitioning into academia. So I worked in the crime lab for a long time. And then I got pregnant with my first son and I decided to apply for a position at George Mason. So prior to applying to that position at George Mason, um, I actually had the opportunity to get started with teaching as an adjunct instructor at the University of Maryland University College. So through this opportunity, I taught classes both face-to-face -face and in hybrid settings. And if you are interested in being a college professor, I highly recommend that you look into becoming an adjunct faculty member or adjunct instructor with your local community college or with one of these online universities because it gives you kind of a way to get your feet wet. Um, 
So with that experience, um, I decided to apply again to George Mason. Yes, with a master's, I do not have a PhD yet. Um, but um, there are some full-time positions that are going to allow you to, um, to become a full-time professor with, with a master's. So I was lucky to get that opportunity. So I teach both undergraduate and graduate classes in forensic science. And I'm also involved with research at the university. I am the principal investigator for our forensic DNA laboratory. So I run all of our DNA laboratory operations. And as I mentioned, I'm also a part of the STEM accelerator program. And we have several goals, some of which include recruiting people to STEM, retaining our students once we get them, um, also decreasing their time to job placement. So I have a very unique position and that I get a reduced teaching load for that. So a lot of term faculty teach three to four classes per semester. I only teach two because again, I get that reduced teaching load for my STEM efforts. So some of the pros and cons of academia, I cannot emphasize enough flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. <laughs> so this may be very specific to my department and my university, but I know when I worked in the DNA lab, it was nine to five, every day, 30 minute lunch break. If you leave 10 minutes early, put in a leave slip. In academia, we have much more flexibility. I can work from home. I can go in at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, depending on when my classes are. Um, so that has been a huge plus for me as a mother of young children. It also can be very rewarding and fulfilling having to being able to experience those student successes, I just cannot express to you how amazing that feels to, to be able to see your students succeed. It's, it's just a feeling I can't even describe. And then also contributing to scholarly research is a huge pro as well. I enjoy research. I like being a term faculty because I'm not forced to do research. I can do it at my leisure, um, but knowing that I'm contributing to that is, is great. Cons, so no days off unless you force yourself to take time off. So if there's any other teachers here, you all I'm sure can totally resonate with this. So while we do have that flexibility in hours and days and that kind of thing, the reality is even when we're not on campus, we're still working. There's always grading to be done. There's always emails to return. So, you know, it's very hard sometimes to balance your work life situation when you're, you know, you basically carry your office with you constantly. So you have to set those boundaries for my students. I tell them, you know, I will not respond to emails over the weekend unless they're absolutely urgent or an emergency. Um, if that's the case, please write that on your email that it is an emergency. Um, it also can be discouraging if you allow it to be. So for me, I am a constant perfectionist and um, sometimes it is difficult dealing with not achieving perfection in academia. Um, and sometimes that is very much so in your face um, in the form of student reviews. <laughs> um, granted, some scathing student reviews are just, you know, it's just a, a, the name of the game. But um, when you try so hard to give as much as you can to your students and you realize you just will never reach that perfection, um, letting go of that can be challenging. And then, you know, not being able to make the impact you want due to the the bureaucracy that's involved with being, you know, working at a public institution such as a university. So before I go, I just want to wrap up with outreach. So I definitely went a little bit longer than I thought I was going to. But if you guys have questions, please, um, again, hit me up in the in the slack. Um, so what is outreach? Providing help, advice, or other services for people who would not otherwise get these services easily. So I posted about this um, on my Instagram page. If you're on Instagram, follow me at Kelly the Scientist. Um, but you know, you all can read my post in more detail. But I wanted to explain why outreach is important to me. Um, the essence of this Stephen Jay Gold quote is that, you know, 
the thought that there are so many potential people of incredible intellect that have gone unnoticed and have never been able to reach their full potential. His quote says, because they lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. For me, outreach is important to me because I correlate it to people of incredible intellect who never get to reach their full potential because they were underrepresented and underserved. And so my goal in outreach is to reach those people who you know, have all of this potential and may not have the access or the resources in order to, you know, reach the sky because of whatever situation they're in. So why should outreach be important to you as a STEM professional? Uh, you know, Muhammad Ali says service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. So, you know, this is just a little bit of what we can do to give back to others. Other things are exposure to career opportunities and recruitment to STEM, public uh, providing information to the public uh, regarding your field. So we want the public in general to be more knowledgeable about what we do in STEM. I think we've seen this more than ever, especially as STEM gets more intertwined with politics, that there's just an incredible amount of misinformation about STEM and what it is that we do. So I think outreach is one way we can combat this. Um, also being able to provide access to STEM when formal access through schools is not possible. And again, going along those science communication lines, having this opportunity to dispel myths about your field, all great reasons to get involved in outreach. So I'm gonna kind of fly through these, but you know, at any level of your career, you can get involved in outreach. If you're a student, think about doing outreach through your student clubs. If you're working in industry, you know, if you don't have an outreach arm at your agency, talk to your supervisors, explain to them the importance of outreach, see if they would be willing to participate in some activities. If you work at a university, you know, a lot of universities are open to starting formal programs and coordinating outreach efforts for your college. And as an individual, all of you can do this. I'm sure 99% of you on here are involved in social media. And again, we're providing access to something, to a resources that people would not normally have access to. So if you think about the number of students and individuals and you know, people in general that are on social media, by sharing your science and your perspective and your journey on social media, I consider that to be a form of outreach because you're making this a mobile opportunity for people to gain access to STEM resources. So we can all do our part. Um, one of my programs is the females of color and those underrepresented in STEM. So one thing I had mentioned on my previous slide is get connected with people who are already doing outreach. <laughs> so um, if any of you are in the area and are interested in working with our program, please send me a message, go to our website, focusonstem.org, click get involved and let me know how you'd like to get involved. There's lots of different ways you can get involved with outreach and I have them all listed here. Participating in career fairs, planning your own STEM events like the STEM Success Summit. Hello, yes, outreach. Um, donating to outreach, creating content to be used for outreach, becoming a mentor. These are all amazing ways that people can get involved in outreach. It doesn't have to be some huge magical program. You know, there are small things that everybody can do to get involved. And a tip, passion can translate to profit. So a lot of people don't like to talk about this side of outreach because the thought is if it's outreach, it must be free. Providing access doesn't mean that the program is necessarily completely free of charge. So if you are passionate about STEM and you make a connection with um, a program or something and you're able to create a program, you can actually make it a win-win situation. You can provide access and you can also um, set up a situation for yourself where you can also have that as kind of a side hustle. You can make money from doing these things as well. So pros and cons, the pros are very self-explanatory. 
Um, the cons, funding um, on a smaller scale, again, not a big deal if you're doing things on a small scale. When you're going for bigger scale programs like mine, funding can be an issue. And then for me, one big con is saying no. <laughs> you love it so much that you have a hard time ever saying no to any outreach opportunity. Um, and once the word gets out, it never stops. So, you know, finding that balance between doing too much um, and doing your part can be difficult at times. And uh, one of my last success tips is outreach can help renew your purpose and your love for STEM. So if you feel like you're in a rut in your career right now, take up an outreach opportunity, mentor somebody, get involved, and you would be surprised how it can change your perspective on what you're doing professionally. So just a wrap up what some of my tips were. Remember your grades don't define your intelligence or your potential for success. Make sure to get those mentors and sponsors. Get your network together. Don't feel bad about changing your mind. It's okay, however late in the game it is. Use that knowledge you gained as a STEM expert to become a consultant or something else that you can do in order to translate that expertise um, into something that is beneficial for you. And your passion can translate to profit, yes. And last but not least, outreach can help renew your purpose and your love for STEM. So if you are interested, go ahead and connect with me. That's my Instagram, send me an email. And because I run my mouth too much, I have no time for questions, but I'm gonna go over to the Slack channel and we can talk there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Excellent job. You dropped some major keys for us in there. And wow, I mean, really, really cool career. We had a lot of questions for you. Uh, so there's a lot of questions for you in the Slack channel. Go ahead and uh, okay. open your gifts. <laughs> uh, and yeah, anyone that's listening, please tune into the Slack channel, stemmedia.slack.com. And Kelly's going to be there hanging around for a little bit to answer questions. We are now getting ready for our next session. You did amazing, Kelly. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Hopefully Bye. I'll see you soon.